I need to do it for me. And I, but I, I realized, no, that's it's all about you, Tom. Yeah. No. <laughs> Tom's here at the Tom Protocol. Guys, right, yeah, that, <laughs> turn it to the green gold. So welcome back, everyone, to the magic we call an almost perfect podcast. It is good to have you back this week. We are all here together. This is this isn't a usual occurrence lately. So uh, I'm John. Glad you're here. I'm to my left was I guess it'd be to my left is Tom over there. Tom, good where morning. you at right now, brother? Yeah, buenos dias. All right. Buenos dias. It's good to have you. Where are you at this morning? I, oh, I'm at home inside, you know, uh, I'm an insider today because of the, uh, oh, it's, you know, for all you guys who might be watching from Wisconsin, it is a, it is a freezing 50 something degrees here. So. <laughs> yes. Bundle up, Tom. Bundle, Bundle up. up. Yeah. <laughs> it's a wet cold though. So it feels colder. Yeah. It feels yeah. Cold. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. And uh, Mr. Weatherman down there is Wade. Wade, how are you today, today, brother? I'm good. I'm 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 staying warm inside, but I'm I'm here with Tom. <laughs> <laughs> you guys keep that like the line down the middle. You stay on your side, and I'll stay on my side. That's right. Yeah, I'm living with him now. He's adopted. I wouldn't That's call good. it living. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Feel the love in this room. Feel the love. Uh, <laughs> so welcoming to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got Brad. Brad, how are you this morning, brother? I am here. I'm I'm doing well. I'm at home too. Just just cause. Just cause. I Brad was telling window. us before. Yeah, go ahead. I, go ahead. I, I have a window out in my office. And so uh, there's there's this natural air conditioning going on in my office. All these years we've been talking about getting the air conditioning fixed. We finally got it fixed and then they broke a window in our church over the weekend. And so <laughs> have, So so what were you preaching about? Um um the spirit <laughs> coming through and blowing through, like you know, no, it uh yeah, I don't know what it was, but uh careful what you asked for. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that that that's sad when the preacher doesn't remember what he preached. So. Oh well, you know. <laughs> but as as a preacher who ha, who two days later couldn't tell you what I preached the previous Sunday without a long moment of pause, you know, yeah. long pause. Mm-hmm. I'm going, nah, I'm, you know, that's the kettle calling the pot black. Yeah, there you they're go. like I children, see. man. Once they leave, you don't talk to them anymore. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> oh man in one ear out the other you know that's so, it that's it uh, brad was telling us information like, i talked about the baptism of jesus but that's neither here nor there i mean it's everywhere but that's neither here nor there. brad was telling us before we started that his church was broken into over the weekend that yeah is not yeah. cool yeah not cool not cool but they didn't take anything right. turns out though that it was cool right brad it's it's still cool <laughs> it's cool now it's very cool <laughs> now. everything is just cool man i'm it's just saying cool. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say the, the two things y'all needed to do is one repair the window and the other is close all the doors that the that the whoever broke in open yeah. outside of that it's not you know for everybody else at home listening mm-hmm. uh, they could every there didn't seem to be anything else other than <laughs> things say. open yeah I, I lost say. a couple trinkets and stuff in my office that were on the windowsill when they kicked it in but uh, uh, and then there was glass everywhere and for goodness sakes please uh, all of those folks who are on trustees or anything like that in any church please invest in a good vacuum cleaner because you know these little cheap things these old 20 year old is there things. such a thing though really anymore yeah well you got to get a commercial one you know i mean you really need to get a commercial those little and dirt devils no I'm, dirt I'm, devils I'm, don't they, belong in church they don't belong in church <laughs> right i mean that's a sacred thing here there's something holy or, 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 uh, amiss about that anyway you know it's so one of the ironies of life go ahead but it's one of the ironies of life tom that a good vacuum cleaner sucks that's exactly right <laughs> only the good ones only the, only the good ones, ones. But I, I want clarification so so is it, when you're as saying get a, a commercial uh vacuum cleaner are you talking about only the ones you see on tv no 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 <laughs> they have to have advertisements on the bag or on the side you know yeah yeah you need a rainbow <laughs> i have yeah. a kirby i have two kirby hey, i'll sell you a kirby man that's what i used to have and, and uh, we bought 
two Kirby's for the church in San Benito when I was down there because the, the little ones that we had that were, you know, domestic little home, they were horrible and they would not clean up anything. And uh, uh, after a while, the belts slip and then, the, you know, they just they just don't do anything. I love my Kirby, man. But man. the Kirby's were really good. They were heavy as all get out. Carrying them up and down stairs was not fun. But I, I used to uh, service Kirby's. <laughs> Did you really? Jobs when I was in school. Yeah. Taking them apart, oh. clean them, replace all the parts, all blah, blah, yep. blah, blah, blah. So anyway. And people say, oh, you have a Kirby? Those are expensive. Here's my deal on the Kirby. I bought it for $20 at a divorce garage sale. Wow. There you go, dude. So, yeah. so I, I just want to explain to everyone or apologize to everyone. I'm the one who started this on this rabbit trail. <laughs> And look where you've taken us, Tom. Very good. <laughs> and if, if now, if you get, uh, are going to get a vacuum cleaner, we're glad. Uh, but yeah, yeah, those just make sure it's looking, a good one, whatever it is. Yeah. I don't care about the brand. I just want to make sure that it really, really does clean. That's the thing. Well, well speaking of get that glass out of your perfect, carpet. Uh, household goods podcast, there we go. See, we don't or, suck, or or we don't suck, <laughs> <laughs> or. Things you can find when you are a TSA agent. So I have here the list. <laughs> nice segue, dude. Nice, nice segue. segue. <laughs> <laughs> this is the TSA's top 10 catches of 2021. And don't you worry, guys. Texas makes the list. Of course. I'm gonna give I'm gonna give you the 10 kind of sort of rapid order, and then you can decide which one you think. <laughs> was found in Texas. Okay. A chainsaw, a wine holder shaped like a gun, fireworks, a machete, <laughs> bear spray, a meat cleaver, a gun belt buckle, a meth burrito, antique pistol, <laughs> and bullets and deodorant. Well, I'm going with the chainsaw or the burrito. Definitely not the bear spray. We don't have any bears. Oh, yeah, bear, no, not, the, not the bear spray. The, everything else could be on the list. Absolutely, dude. Yeah. So <laughs> at Ho Hobby International Airport, <laughs> so they found a meth burrito. A meth wow. burrito. I don't even know what that is. Well, <laughs> all you uh, need to know is burrito. <laughs> burrito <laughs> who cares i mean who cares what they put in it people yeah, talk about right. all the time right you put sauce on it and it's all game <laughs> it's all there you go man i <laughs> do something to mean entertain yourself during the flight so this is great we've gone from talking about marijuana <laughs> to meth in the last couple of weeks we <laughs> we are doing well folks i maintain that we're not talking about meth we're talking about burritos but you do what you want. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> So that, that fits into the food <laughs> category, you know, food. There you mm -hmm. go. Okay, I got another one. Food for you. Uh, there is a 106-year-old woman who lives in South Philadelphia, just had her 106th birthday. Um, and if I remember correctly, there's a woman somewhere in the Midwest, maybe, who's like 113, 114, now, 15. I heard, the, I heard this story. I heard this woman move to um, uh, Bel Air. Is that correct? <laughs> With her auntie and uncle. Yeah. Hey, did you see they're making a, a reboot of Bel Air called Bel Air? Yeah. It's I, sort I, of I like a something about that. I don't know anything about it though. I haven't seen it. I thought it was a joke. I thought it was like Babylon B or something, but it seems legit. I it look doesn't look quite as uplifting, funny, but whatever. But Dorothy Ned turned 106 this past Friday, and she credits two things to getting her to 106. You want to take any guesses? I mean, that's what we always want to ask the 100-year-old, right? How did you get here? What would you Meth guess? burritos. Meth burritos. <laughs> yeah, and obviously, you know. I met her in, in Hobby Airport one afternoon. Because <laughs> <laughs> they, obviously, in a panel of four pastors, uh, Faith would be a part of that. I would hope so. It. Thanks yeah, for but, redeeming us, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> But a meth burrito is more funny. <laughs> I'm just going. Not if you're 106. I don't think it was a chainsaw. I guarantee you that. No, um, she she said. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, no, go ahead. That's all right. I just don't think it was a chainsaw. No one change. She says, "Serving the Lord." There you go. Amen. Very good. And then her granddaughter says, "Grandma always used to take me to church." You know what? 
these grandmas and grandpas, man, we need them again. We need them. Uh, she said, and then the granddaughter after church, we would sometimes go to the McDonald's and my grandma got a Big Mac. She was getting Big Macs for a long time. Wow. So the Lord and Big Macs. And taking your grandkids to church. Take, there you go. There taking you your go. grandkids yeah, to church. But coming one. back to, you know, this story and the stories that we t told before, while we were being recorded, but not before we started officially. Uh, and, you know, talking about a 97-year-old 90, World War II mm -hmm. vet who is an uh, Eagle Scout in the 30s and all of that is, uh, and, and uh, you know, it just reminds me as a pastor, one of the blessings, uh, uh, you know, one of the times when it was really a joy to do a funeral, it was always someone who was 90 plus and had been a faithful member of, uh, of uh, a congregation. And I mean, I look back on, you know, my uh, 90 plus year old uh, former pastor who, uh, who was just a delight to be around. Uh, and, uh, and when he died, you know, it was, he, he, he died while he was, I think he was 90, he was around 97, 95, 97, and still driving, which probably was not a wise choice. But uh, anyway, he was, you know, he was involved in an accident that eventually took his life. And, but, you know, even under those circumstances, it was still a joy uh, to celebrate uh, all the things that, that, uh, and I called him sure. Reverend Bryce to the day, you know, to the day he died, he was Reverend Bryce. And, and so, you know, along the line of just joking around is it honestly, you know, for those of you who are faithful in the Lord and you may be 40, 50, you may be 30, man, you're going to be a delight. Amen to that. There you Amen. go. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, gentlemen. So let's talk about a new study just came out. Um, I want to get your impressions about some of these things here. I also have some kind of big questions I want to ask you. Of course, anything that you, you found as well. But, you know, as, as much talk as there is about church and people leaving church and blah, 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 this article says, the first sentence, the vast majority of evangelicals are satisfied with many characteristics of their membership church. More than 38% of churchgoers wouldn't change a thing, y'all. Uh, before we jump into it, can you help me? Who or what is an evangelical? Well, aren't they rednecks? No. According to... <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, they tend to be uh, more on the conservative side is kind of the target of Republican. Uh, uh -huh. and I, you know, I'm not trying to be political I, here. Are they one like thing, that. really? Huh? Are, I are don't think you can define an evangelical thing? with with a political party. I think that's a, a that's thing. What's happened, right? Um, well, that, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a societal thing, but I don't think that defines what an evangelical is. Um, an evangelical is someone who is very much in tune to the gospel and to the sharing of the gospel for the purposes of building up the kingdom. Now, that's the, the textbook definition of an evangelical. Yeah, I think fortunately not everybody fits into that and would agree with that or even understand that. And so that's, that's another issue altogether. So yeah, I um, think given the climate around our country right now, that that's an ideal um, definition. But I think that there are people out there who, um, who uh, attend churches uh, that call themselves um, evangelicals who also see that as a as a political position or a politically informed position i would I love, agree I would, I would love for that for brad's take on that definition to be the actual thing but uh, but just you know just like a lot of words that we love um, i think that one's been hijacked to a certain extent Oh, more than more than hijacked. Yeah, I mean, it's it's taken captive and and and, and you know abused, I, and I think that's a big issue for us today in the church. Is that we we've, we've tried to create labels that really aren't accurate as far as their own definition. 
and that's a big issue. Um, I, I consider myself an orthodox evangelical, which is very, very different than the, the popular cultural notion of an evangelical. Um, and, and the definition that I gave just a minute ago is, is based upon that orthodoxy, that, that right worship, that right order of praise, and that right order of, of glorifying God. That's what orthodox means. And, and to put that into practice means an orthopraxis, which is to put it into right worship practice. And so how does your life um, center around right worship and right practice? That's, that's an orthodox position. There's, what, I mean, what is right? And because well, I'm getting there. Know. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting but, there to yeah. define to define orthodoxy is to, to say that there is an accepted standard by which worship should be practiced and, and worship should be be done. And that standard is, you know, 17, 18, 1900 years old. And then some it comes from the early church. And I mean, this is the. <laughs> This is the Nicholas and Arius, you know, thing. What is right worship? Well, it also has to do with right definition, you know, which is why St. Nicholas slapped the snot out of, you know, Arius in a conference over the definition of whether or not Jesus is, is truly of the same uh, uh, essence of God. And so there's this, what does that, does that mean that Orthodox, you know, Christians like to go slap people? No, that, that's, that's, that's not what that means either. But I think you're exactly right that the problem is, is that we have co-opted terms that are no longer the defining moment or the defining uh, term for a particular set of beliefs or a system of beliefs or a way of life. And, you know, I don't think that's fair, but it, it is what we have to deal with. So evangelical in our country today is something that's very um, it, it, it has it carries with it a lot of baggage that I don't think is accurate. Sure. Um, you know, Tom, you said that evangelicals tend to be more conservative. Well, they, they do tend to be more conservative, but evangelicals are very much into, you know, uh, uh, sharing the gospel with anybody and everybody, and no one should be excluded in that. Um, as, as opposed to what others might say of evangelicals as being very um conservative and limited in, in who they should reach and, and who is accepted and who is not accepted. I, again, I don't think we can get a fair definition of this one way or another. And so when I read articles like this, where they start characterizing evangelicals, my, my first inclination is to define evangelical, just like you're asking. Yeah, uh, they did not. I mean, they didn't even attempt to do that. in the article. No, not at all. Well, well yeah. on, the, on the backside, they did go to, uh, uh, the study defines evangelical Protestants as those agreeing that the Bible is the highest authority. So that's one of the tenets. Okay. Right? It's, it's right. Uh, a high view of scripture. <clears throat> scripture is authoritative. Yes. Yes. Uh, those who say it's important to encourage non-Christians to accept Jesus as their savior. That's the sort of. Uh, that's the personal, evangelical part. The sort of personal experience right. with Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, those believing Jesus death on the cross is the only sacrifice for sin. Mm -hmm. uh, so a high view of Jesus. And those who trust in Jesus alone for salvation, um, which so like when I first came to faith and getting more introduced to the United Methodist Church, I was told there's a, there's a difference between mainline church and evangelical church. And then, you know, as the United Methodist Church being a mainline church, I always thought well, that's weird because I, I was learning our history and I learned that we came out of the uh, what is it? The uh, United Anglican. Well, no, uh, the United Methodist Church, when we, when we formed, right? Oh, oh, yeah. Evangelical <laughs> Brethren. We, we came Evangelical from the, United Brethren, right. I'm like, United well, Brethren, yeah. It's there in our old name, so obviously there must be something. But anyway, so I think we have to come to terms with when the world kind of uses that, they mean something. And then a lot of us have sort of taken on that meaning, but it's probably, it's not what it means mm -hmm. at all. So, um, But anyway, which is a good conversation, because then you decide, well, what do we call ourselves? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, right. you're, you're, the definition you just read of evangelical, I mean, you know, <laughs> I think there is, uh, I think it's pretty well known that Methodists are in wide disagreement about a lot of things right now. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 but when I hear that definition, I'm like, that's, sounds like 
most Methodists who I hang around with. And I don't think that generally in the national discourse all the time, Methodists are necessarily included in this discussion of evangelicalism. So yeah, well, and, and, and I was going to say uh, from the perspective of who they were, uh, we know that they were uh, uh, what was it, uh, asking the question of those uh, in the Baptist Church, because that was one of the one of the churches that was uh, described, and and I, I I'm thinking probably uh, when I think of evangelical and and let's say uh, uh, Southern Baptist is kind of the direction I I view the national view of evangelical. Now, like like you, Wade, I'm going. Uh, even uh, uh, as a United Methodist, I, I, in our conversations, uh, in our conversations and in, in conversations with other United Methodists, um, you know, uh, I guess I'm surprised because I've, I've, I've uh, followed the lead of the culture that, that has branded us as something other than what we really are which is we, we do believe in the Bible. We have a, a high, most of us have a high view of scripture. Most of us uh, believe that uh, Jesus Christ uh, was uh, God and man, uh, that through his uh, uh, death and resurrection, we experience both uh, forgiveness of sins and new life and hope. I mean, we can just go through all of those. And I was thinking of another, another word that, that, we've uh, that has has kind of been a popular way to describe a particular group of people is that they're fundamentalists and uh, and and, it, and it's so interesting because because fundamentals most of us would agree with the idea of fund there are fundamental basic truths about playing football about uh you know about writing a sentence you know i mean you can just go through where fundamentals are the foundation but to be called a fundamentalist is a negative thing so right you know uh, yeah. but coming back to the actual article i think john we you you should kind of direct us with the whatever the next question is sure but let's that's also I, I think that's a good conversation to have though because um yeah we, we hear on the news all the time about evangelicals and the reason why we hear it on the news is because not because the the news cares about what's happening in the church but because that is a sort of it is a political political entity now and uh, we need to be careful how we sort of associate with that and mm -hmm. and how we how our witness sort of stands against that so to your point tom here's the um the article about the vast majority of evangelicals being satisfied with many characteristics of a church, more than 38% who say they wouldn't change a thing. Here are some of the statistics. 85% are satisfied with the lengths of sermons and services. How many, how, how many minutes are you, Wade? 20-ish. Brad? 15 to 20. What were you, Tom? Uh, right at 22 minutes, um, yeah. you know, without, without trying. I'm about an 18 to 22 minute myself. All right. Mm -hmm. Uh, 68 percent minutes this last Sunday. No, <laughs> <laughs> busted. I had to get the Jesus in you, man. That's Golly. right. Uh, 68 percent, 68 percent are satisfied with the amount of political involvement and or political messages. 77% are fine with the number of women in church leadership, including 78% of women. And 74% are satisfied with the level of racial, racial, racial and ethnic diversity in their church. Still, <laughs> still, well, th there's a, some questions to be asked, right? But still about 80% of evangelicals would make changes to at least one category. 11% would like more political involvement or political messages, while 22% prefer less. 30% would like more in-depth teaching. 30%, 32% would like a different type of music, almost evenly split, split between traditional and more contemporary. 38% would like more community outreach. 27% would like more focus on evangelism. And 23% want more diversity. So is it good that our churches are satisfied? 
But it, I, I want to say this uh, before we answer that question is, it's there's a hundred percent chance that the the whatever the thirty two percent is going to to chime in on music one way or the other, or they're going to ch chime in the twenty two and uh, uh, eleven percent uh, political more more political less political and and usually uh, let's go with the the political statement. I can I, I can just about guarantee if the person is under thirty they want more. If the person is over 50, they want less. Uh, and, and anytime I've even come remotely close to, to being political, I have heard about it. And uh, in, in fact, one person uh, left the church, another, you know, and then I heard about a, uh, another person who was angry because, and, and my basic message was not a political message. I started with a political scene and, and, and that didn't go over well. So, so you're gonna, you know, even though there's, uh, most people are satisfied, what you're gonna hear from is that 20 to 30% who are not satisfied mm -hmm. as and a that, pastor. Which all of that is, is, a, is a, a little bit comical. Um, oh yeah. Because the gospel um, in its context is a political, it's a politically charged subversive message mm -hmm. and, uh, and and i think there's i think there's a certain sense in which um this study would tell us maybe that we we need to neuter that some more and i think you know and i don't know if we have or we haven't um obviously we're we are communicating the gospel outside of its original context and so what political meant then and what it means now um, aren't necessarily the same thing yeah. So, so Brad, then um, let's assume our churches are comfortable. Is that a good thing or not? Yes. Or sat no. Satisfied, excuse me. Is that a good yeah. thing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No. I, I think, I think, I think you're right with the word comfortable because satisfaction and comfort go hand in hand in these kinds of contexts. Okay. And I think um, the question is if we are satisfied or comfortable um, are we growing? You know, I mean, that's, that's a real question. Are we growing sure. deeper in our faith? If, if, if everything is, is as we like it, are we being challenged? Are, are we being drawn closer to Christ in, in everything? And I'm not saying we need to just stir the pot just for the sake of stirring the pot. But I think the truth of the matter is, is that when we get, you know, satisfied and comfortable, we become complacent. And complacency, you know, what's the, the old image of, of you know, the, the Sea of Galilee going into the Dead Sea? You know, as long as water is flowing, it's, it's alive and vibrant and things grow in it. When it sits stagnant, it dies and everything around it dies. And so when a, when a church becomes so complacent with its and, and satisfied with its own uh, stuff that, that they finally gotten themselves, you know, comfortable in their pews, um, when does the gospel get to be experienced outside of that? Does the gospel even get experienced inside that? If, if I'm not being challenged, I'm not growing. And, uh, and I think that's something we all need to acknowledge that growth happens when we're being challenged. Um, it, it, well, sorry. But, well, I was going to say, but there is, and I did note the difference between saying satisfied and comfortable in in the article and mm -hmm. as i was thinking uh, about that there is you know th there is a distinction because satisfied doesn't necessarily necessarily mean i'm comfortable in fact you know uh, i can be dissatisfied with uh, with a particular type of let's say a, a service for example mm -hmm. uh you know i've got a uh, i've got a trainer just uh, say a it tom you were dissatisfied well, no, gotta, when you I, came I gotta, to my church this weekend, right? That's what you're saying. <laughs> That's what you want to say. Just say it, Tom. What you say? You were dissatisfied by my sermons. Say it. No, no, no. Uh, I was, I, I was coming back uh, to the fact that 
you know, the other the other week I had a you know had a one uh, one session free a free session with somebody to 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 work on 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 uh, the weights to teach me the weights at the gym, and 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 she took me through that and and I was not comfortable. I was not comfortable. Uh, she put made me go farther or, or further in the process than I wanted to go. I was satisfied because I wasn't there to be comfortable. I was there to be to be challenged and to be strengthened. And I think I think that um, that within the context of the church, I'm going to be dissatisfied if I'm too comfortable within the context of church. I want to. There has to be a, a level of. Uh, of moving me forward in my relationship with Christ, in my relationship with others, and that's why I think it's it's significant that there is a difference between in this study satisfied versus comfortable. So having a that. having a uh, depending on what your sense of what church is, what worship is, probably dictates what you're talking about, right? If you feel like church is there to serve you, and if they're not serving you the right way then you're dissatisfied and you're not, you know, they're challenging, you're not comfortable. But if you understand church to be something more than you, then maybe, you know, if you're singing a song you don't like, it doesn't bother you because it's not about you, maybe. Right, well, right. Yeah, and I don't want us to slip into this this mindset of consumerism. Well, that's what we are, right? I, well, we are, and I, and I hate that because, you know, I, I think that's a big issue with the church today is that when we're not being served, when we're not being uh, fed, fed or, or however you want to phrase it, the first instant or the first inclination is to get up and leave and don't come back to there. You go find somewhere else or you don't do it at all. And I think that's the question that I have about satisfaction and comfort is that when we get too comfortable, church becomes an option, not a place where I'm going to get challenged, not, not a place where I'm going to be challenged to, to new, new exercises and, and exercise my faith in a new and, and uh, 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 holistic way. Uh, so let me ask you, Wade, I had a, another big picture question, two of them, I think they're kind of related. Uh, if everyone is happy, am I actually doing a good job as a pastor? And then the other question was, if everyone is sort of satisfied, um, did we get lucky that everybody feels that way? Or was that by design? I would say yes and no to both of those questions. Um, you are such a United Methodist. God, Lee, man. Um, you know, I, if everybody in church, um, <coughs> if everybody in church was comfortable and satisfied, and I'm talking about like overarching church in the United States, then we wouldn't be, um, we wouldn't be contracting. Um, so, uh, however, I think you could also say <laughs> if, if everybody is um, dissatisfied, then maybe we wouldn't be contracting. I, I don't, I don't think that there, I don't think you can draw a conclusion from all of that. Mm. Um, you know, I, I think probably a lot of this goes back to, um, comfortable and satisfied really shouldn't even be a measure necessarily. Um, I think more engaged and curious would be. Uh, and to me, that goes back oh. to talking about what orthodoxy is uh, and isn't and what uh, evangelicalism is or isn't. Um, it's, you know, I don't think any of those things is a position or a static place that we stand, you know, learning uh, throughout the history is progressive. And I don't mean progressive in the sense of like a, uh, an ideology, but you know. It progresses. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. We, learn, we learn more and more and more. And so. That's so, another one of those words that gets co-opted wrong. And, yeah, well, I mean, I, I, think, I think it's, you know, it's kind of, it, yeah. that's one of those words that just, it has a, I mean, when I say progressive is, is, a, is learning, it's not, a, it's not a position, it's just a fact that you know, we didn't make Volkswagens uh, in Jesus's time. Now we do, um, or you know, maybe we don't so much anymore. But, but you know, but there's just things that we didn't know and that we got to deal with. I remember, you know, growing up, you know, the first test tube baby. Remember that? And and were we were we out there on the edge of of calling ourselves God and all of that? There's a big religious um, 
uh, sort of discussion. And now, you know, um, in vitro and um, and, uh, and 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 fertility um, has become a science that I think is more generally accepted by the church than maybe um, when it came on the horizon, you know. Sure. Uh, and so to me, that's a, a progressive learning. Um, I'm not saying necessarily that whatever, you know, that conjures up for people um, is, is the point or is, a, uh, or is a, a, a something that needs to be um, deemed necessary or okay. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that things change so much, you know. Sure. What's the morality of having one of these sticking out of your ear or having your eyes on it all the time? I think there's probably some problems with that. And I think there, there's probably some really amazing things that can happen with that. Um, it's not a, it's not an either or thing. It's a, it's a contextual thing. And so I think when we measure these things, we have to, uh, it, I, I don't think we can, you know, I think it's tempting, especially for me to measure, you know, what's going on now with, with what's, what was going on when scripture was written and how do we draw inference <laughs> that? And I, you know, and I think we all know from uh, our education that that's a, that's a, that can be a slippery slope. And so um, the article sounds very general to me. And, and the thing is, you know, they're not, uh, they're, they're polling, I assume, um, they're polling people who are in different churches doing different things with different points of view. And what's satisfied and comfortable is to one person uh, may look completely different than the other. And I don't even... I, I, there's a there's a sense in which um, I think probably this article may fall into the category of of clickbait clickbait more than it might into the area of actual um, analysis and uh, uh, and forethought. You know, so I don't well, know. I don't know if it's helpful. I think it's helpful to have a discussion, but I don't know that I don't know that what they. Uh, and you know we don't know the parameters of our study and what the questions exactly were and those kinds of things but um I, you know i think it's great to to sort of spur discussion but i, I don't know if we can draw anything um, so one of the things i thought when i first uh, was reading about it something kind of attuned to what you said i think first off was uh did we frame this wrong are we framing this wrong asking people how satisfied they are with stuff at church like going back to, I think Brad, you said it about, you know, consumerism. I mean, if we're, if we're gonna keep framing things in consumeristic ways, well, how else do we expect people to not think that way about church or anything else? And so is there a better way to frame what's happening uh, in our local congregations instead of, are you merely satisfied with it? You know, and there's one part of me and that, you know, it's probably the initial one that says, who cares if you're satisfied, right? I don't, I don't do this stuff to, you know, satisfy myself either. So you know, why should we care? But then maybe if we reframe what we mean by how we are participating and being a part of what's happening, maybe that, that's more helpful. Uh, the, the cynical side of me um, says that this is, uh, something that pastors want to keep talking about because, uh, quite frankly, the more satisfied or comfortable that people may be in church, the more money they may give. <laughs> and as soon as you start making people uncomfortable, uh, if they take themselves away from church, well, that means they take their money away from church. And we can't have that, right? And Talk about so, consumerist. Exactly. Well, exactly I, mean, right. that's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's where we are, but, right? Yeah. On the on the on the practical side is, and I, I I will have to be say I was as a pastor over a church, I was very aware of uh, of uh, you know uh, you know I honestly could not tell you the top five givers in in uh, in at Asbury based on looking at the numbers because I never looked at the numbers, but I had an idea of which were some of the more um, significant givers within our church. And, um, and you know, um, I, I'm not going to say I, I started doing something or stopped doing something specifically because somebody was a, a, a large giver, but in the, in the decision-making process that did come into, into uh, it was a part of the context of making it a decision so it was influenced by well are, are we going to lose givers on this uh 
you know, are we going to gain give, givers on this? Are people going to be more generous uh, if we do this? So it's hard for us as pastors to to not take those things into consideration you know as much as we want to say we're going to preach the gospel no matter what we're going to preach you know the 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 love of god and the love of christ and the power of the holy spirit no matter what and the reality is is that the gospel itself is extremely offensive to culture i mean it is countercultural, and it is um something that we have to take into consideration and you know, when Jesus started out preaching, he was preaching the love of God and the, and the blessing of the kingdom and all of those things that were going to bless people and so on and so forth. But by the time that he's nearing the end of his ministry, you know, he didn't have the crowds behind him anymore, that they began to kind of trickle away for whatever reason. And it wasn't that he was, he had changed his message all that much, but he began to talk about what it means to truly be a part of this kingdom that is being inaugurated here and, and how hard, how difficult it's going to be. It's the, it's the thing that, that I think, you know, is best exemplified or, or is uh, among the best exemplified is in, in Dietrich Bonhoeffer's cost of discipleship, that concept of, of knowing that this is not going to be an easy life. Um, and that challenges people. And sometimes people don't want to be challenged that way. And so they will walk and pastors have to walk that fine line of, look, you know, this is not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. And, but the blessing is, is that you're not doing it alone. Um, I think, you, I think you could make an argument that um, within the boundaries of Jesus's life, his ministry was unsuccessful. On, absolutely. In our, absolutely. In our estimation, the success was in preparing. In a cultural, in a worldly ex- estimation. Yeah. And his yeah. success was in preparing a people, um, to, to, you know, burn the ships and, and, and sell out later on. And I, I think one of the key aspects of that, that I know you guys are in tune with is none of that really began to happen without the Holy Spirit, you know, after Pentecost, catching right. those guys mm-hmm. and gals on fire. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and I think at that point, I'm, I'm, you know, I think my assessment or my, maybe it's my desire, um, for those evangelists, those, mm-hmm. you know, disciples of Jesus Christ and the disciples that they created and the churches that, uh, that Paul uh, helped go, Peter and Paul helped go and plant um, became, I think they were wholly dissatisfied a lot of the time, which was, which was what spurred that kind of growth. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, I, there's probably an argument that could be made though that they were wholly satisfied with what it was that they were about mm-hmm. um, and those aren't the same thing necessarily no that's good right. but, uh, yeah. go coming back to something you said and you know brad you said uh they caught on fire and there was pentecost and, and it's interesting so you know the the thing is um prior to the resurrection they were hiding the mm-hmm. resurrection you know, that uh, gave them boldness, but their instructions, then they, you know, they went from, from hiding to bold, but in their boldness, they were also obedient. And what were they obedient to it? They were obedient to wait here until mm-hmm. you receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And, um, and so, so, you know, a lot of times um, we want to move we want, we need, we need to do something. We need to do something right now. And, you know, and, 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 uh, and what we really need to do is be obedient and wait, uh, wait on the Lord uh, and, and wait on that movement of the Holy Spirit. But, you know, as, especially as Americans, and I can tell you, having lived in other cultures, Americans, we, and this is our strength, but it's also our weakness is we want to go out there and we want to get her done. And, 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 and so we'll move into, you know, we'll move into a, a, another culture and we will, we will produce something like a building, a ramp or whatever. Uh, And then we'll leave. And, but we really won't won't have the impact because we didn't wait and, you know, find out what was really going on, uh, including what the spirit was doing in that place. Mm -hmm. I don't remember who said it, where I read it, but the, Jesus parable about the seeds being planted right and mm-hmm. some fell on good land and some was taken up by the birds 
he gave four scenarios and said, Jesus is telling you right there, only 25% of his ministry is going to be successful. Right. Because all the other three out of four, they just, they're, it's gone because whatever reason. And so I think all that's helpful uh, to sort of draw uh, an understanding of maybe what we expect out of our walk with God, with one another in the church. Mm -hmm. And um, how satisfied should I be at church? Maybe that's a reflection point for us to take this week. Um, does it matter if I'm satisfied or not? Um, or, or what are the things that I should be satisfied with? Maybe, again, maybe framing this differently can be more helpful, but uh, all the points that you guys have made, I think have been uh, meaningful. Um, maybe, maybe we'll have to talk about evangelical stuff a little bit more uh, soon, because mm -hmm. that, that, I think that's helpful. Uh, because I think one of the underrated things of this discussion today is that, and it needs to show up in the show notes, is hashtag Larry the Cable Guy. Hashtag get her done. Get her done. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Let's yeah, see. Yeah. We've talked you about know, Larry the I, Cable I, I, Guy, 106-year-old woman, and meth burrito. We do I'm it all you. here. We've, covered, We've got it all covered right there. I, I was not satisfied with the direction that Wade <laughs> took us at that. You know, I just want to, it, it needs to be different because he really had me go in there for a moment. I, he's going to be really, really deep. Oh, well, okay. now he's going to be weighed. Well, you don't you don't donate don't to the podcast well. anyway, so we don't care. I was All trying right. to get us back to almost perfect. You guys are way too perfect today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone, we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for <laughs> tuning in this week. Uh, let us know what you think. What does it mean to be evangelical? What does it mean to walk with God with the church? How satisfied should you be? Uh, at church and um, who makes meth burritos so Tom <laughs> Wade Brad thank you so much for the gift of your time always always good to see you and hear from you hope you all have a great rest of the week and we will see you next week God be with you God be with you peace y'all peace